Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I make the time three o'clock. Uh, it's time to get down to business. Uh, welcome, co council members, press staff, guests. We'll start with this agenda right off the bat. We'll go directly to the Board of Health. And while you're getting that agenda out, and just a reminder, if you have one of these gadgets, if you could make sure it's not going to make a lot of noise, we would appreciate that. And if you can silence it, that would be very helpful. Just a reminder again, as always, our meetings are televised. They are web streamed. Um, Judy Ann McCauley is again volunteering for our broadcast this evening, and we certainly recognize her and thank her again. Our Board of Health member and counselor, Jim Oliver, is on personal business this week and will be back next week. So let's turn to our agenda then, and I would first ask, are there any, are there any matters to declare with respect to a disclosure of pecuniary interest? I hear none. Pages 3 to 10 are printed, our Board of Health minutes from March 28th. I'll just ask if there's anything in there that uh, doesn't sit well with you, and if not, uh, hearing nothing, I will declare those minutes adopted as they are printed. Let's go right to staff reports, and as usual, Dr. Locke is here, and uh, on page 11 is an outline of his report and update to us this evening. Dr. Locke, welcome, and I'll turn things over to you, sir. The, um, probably not on the side, the um, button on the side. There, there, well, there's some light. There, you're on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair. Um, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll refer you just uh, to the outline that I have, uh, just to give you a broad outline of what's been happening in the community. Um, we've, in the long-term care institutions, uh, since January the 16th, we've had 13 outbreaks reported. Uh, 11 of these were respiratory and two were enteric, and uh, they have all been declared over at this point in time, so the community is clear at the moment with regards to the long-term care. Uh, influenza overall, uh, generally, the, the uh, flu is declining all across Canada. Uh, in um, week 14, mostly uh, the strain that we were seeing was influenza B, uh, which was a greater proportion of the influenza that was being reported uh, during that week. And uh, through the season, um, we've had the first wave of flu that came through was influenza A, the H3N2 variety, which is the one that causes most of the problems, um, and hospitalizations. As you can see, uh, the, uh, most of the hospitalizations occurred again once more in the over 65 age group, mainly because um, over that age we are considered immunocompromised, so uh, more likely to get complications from the flu. Um, as far as the rabies is concerned, we had one new case of rabies uh, strain reported, which brings us now to uh, currently 295 cases of raccoon strain and eight cases of uh, fox strain in Ontario. Uh, of the raccoon strain, 295 cases, uh, 232 were in the Hamilton area. Uh, Haldeman had 21. Brent 17, Niagara 15, and Halton uh, 10. So Norfolk has been uh, dodged the bullet on this one and we haven't had any so far. Um, we've had a, a rise in the number of mumps and measles occurring uh, across the world generally. Uh, as you can see there in the Marshall Islands, uh, they've had 220 cases of mumps uh, reported since October of 2016. Uh, in Australia, they've had uh, 20 cases of measles uh, reported since January. And in Thailand, um, more than 70 cases a week of measles have been reported, uh, with um, bordering now on 1,000 cases uh, being reported uh, in Thailand as of January um, uh, 2017. Uh, 
the significance of that is the fact that um, because many people are traveling now and uh, are able to bring it back, if our numbers fall uh, on vaccination coverage here in Ontario, then and we have um, unvaccinated uh, areas or communities which are unva unvaccinated, then of course uh, we can get uh, large outbreaks uh, in these communities uh, being brought back by someone that's been traveling from abroad. Uh, in Zika, uh, the uh, Zika cases are still continuing in South America, and um, uh, they've just been reported again now in Singapore. Uh, they've reported uh, four cases locally, but these are usually uh, very much underreported, and one can assume that uh, there are many more cases than actually get reported. Um, especially in the more rural areas of, um, of the countries and in third world countries where there's not uh, good access to medical care, most of these cases do not get reported and so therefore any reports we get are usually quite underreported. So that's my summary, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, thank you very much. Questions? There may be a question or two. We appreciate your update. Uh, well, before I get to council, I don't see any hands. There may be some. Uh, Dr. Locke, any just coincidence that rabies seem to be reported all around us in raccoons, and yet I've been watching raccoons cross the road and hang around in my backyard since the early February, and yet we don't. We seem to be lucky here that we haven't really had a concern. Is is there any rationale for that, or is it just simply the the, the lay of the land for now? I guess. Uh, I don't. Th I don't think so, Mr. Chair. If if one looks at the uh, there is a, a GIS mapping of all of these cases, and they're all clustered in the in the Greater Hamilton area. Okay. Uh, and what surprises me is that there's more cases haven't occurred uh, further south in the Niagara area and between Niagara and Hamilton. Yes. But it's all clustered around Hamilton. Around the Hamilton. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Anything, Councillor Sonnenberg? Please, our member, Sonnenberg. Uh, thank you. Dr. Locke, uh, we're all encouraged to get a flu shot uh, every year, but we don't know what strain of flu is coming down the pike usually, and we kind of guess at the concoction that we uh, immunize ourselves with. Did we guess right this year? Uh, this year we got it right, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Last year we didn't, this year we did. Uh, the strain that came through uh, was the one that was uh, included in the vaccine. Uh, however, um, <laughs> I'll put a caveat on that because the vaccine itself was not as effective uh, as uh, it has been in the past. So we had about 50, around 50% 50 efficacy with people that uh, had it that came into contact as far as we can see. But uh, yes, generally, um, as you're aware probably that um, we develop our vaccine, it has to be developed several months before the wave comes through here in North America. And we look to the east, uh, Australia particularly, to see what is the prevalent strain there. And the vaccines are then uh, developed for Europe and North America following their lead. Um, so it's, it's fairly, we're fairly confident sometimes that the strain that appears in Australia is the same one that we're going to have here. However, because of that travel across Europe and across um, the Atlantic, etc., by the time it reaches North America, it, um, it sometimes has mutated into a, a slightly different strain. So the vaccine, even though we, we create it and it's um, effective against that particular strain, it may have slightly mutated, so it's not quite as effective by the time it gets here. You any other questions? Member Columbus, please. Yes, Dr. Locke, uh, I heard recently that there was uh, over 100 students that weren't properly vaccinated and that they may, may be suspended from class. Uh, can you share with us, uh, I think the cutoff date was this week sometime. Can yes. you share with us where we're at with that and did they get suspended? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're still decreasing that. Um, I think you'll get a report from, from our manager of uh, vaccine preventable diseases uh, a little bit later on. But generally, we start off with a much larger number. And these numbers are reported from the school and are according to our records that we keep uh, in the health unit. Many of these cases have been immunized, but they have not been reported to us. It's the duty of the parents uh, to tell us that their children have been vaccinated 
uh, and until we start to chase it up, for many different reasons, those reports don't get to us. So the numbers that we start off with are in the several hundreds, and I believe we're now down to just a little bit over 100 as I'm from today. So um, two things that the majority of those students, uh, hopefully we, the last thing we want to do is suspend them. We usually hold special clinics for catch-up, for those people before that suspension becomes um, valid. So they have um, many of, several opportunities to come in and uh, catch up with the vaccine should they need it. Member Black. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm just wondering, I have an 18-year-old daughter and she goes to, to school and to tell you the truth, you know, I know we have some vac vaccinations and I have a little yellow form that's got dates and that sort of thing on it. Um, and I'm not sure if, if, I, if I, even if I'm aware of what are the ones that are required and when and when are they required and uh, what boosters do you need? You know, so is that information um, publicized and promoted and so people know what shots they that are required and when they're required so uh, through you mr. chair yes it's um, uh, the ISPA which is the the act the immunization as immunization of school pupils act that's what uh, uh, says which vaccines are um, compulsory vaccines for, for the kids to be at school um, all of the primary care providers that deliver this vaccine, they have a schedule uh, that they're given. And uh, in their electronic re medical records now, if people are due, it should pop up on their EMR. Um, we, we do have a schedule. Um, it's a bit complicated for all the different vaccines, so I'm not going to try to go through it right now. But um, usually what will happen is if the children are in school, they get advised that they're they're um, a vaccine missing if it hasn't been reported to us. And as I say, many of those vaccines are given by the primary care providers, but the parents haven't reported it to us. So um, yes, there is a schedule, and all of the primary care people that are, that are uh, uh, looking after them should have it flagged in their um, medical records, uh, even to adults that require a tetanus diphtheria, whatever, every 10 years. Uh, it should be on your medical record and your primary care provider should be telling you that it's out. Yeah, I think you mentioned tetanus. Uh, how often should you be getting a tetanus shot? Uh, the present time, uh, three years, Mr. Chair, they're 10 years. Every 10 years. Okay. And uh, the schedule, where could one find that schedule? Is it in the health unit on their w website? or Certainly you can get it from us. I, I don't know whether it's on our website, but I assume it is. Uh, yeah. So we, we have it. If if you requested it, we would give it to. We yeah. could get okay. it. Okay. Great. It to you. Thanks. Turn this on. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sonnenberg has moved. Columbus has seconded that the update from the acting medical officer of health receives information. Any other questions or comments? Those in favor? Ms. Carey, thank you very much. And again. Thank you, Dr. Mott. Let's go now, please, to page 12, a uh, staff report here, partnering together for Healthy Schools Protocol. Marlene and Susan, I'll just turn things over to you, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to introduce uh, Josh Daly. He is our Acting Program Manager for the School Health, and he will be presenting the report, and then we will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Josh, and take it away. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to quickly walk you through the presentation you have in your in your package there, and um, oops, I apologize there. So there's a little bit of context for what the school health team at the health unit does. Um, to start out, we our jurisdiction serves nine secondary schools and 45 elementary schools, and those are largely um, split between the Grand Area District School Board and the Brant Haldeman and Norfolk Catholic District School Board. And then there are a few other private schools and a handful of um, alternative learning locations as well. And public health is mandated to work with our schools as a setting on a variety of health topics, and I'll go through those quickly. Currently, schools don't have a reciprocal mandate to work with us, um, so fostering that partnership is very important for us to achieve our objectives. 
Starting with the clinical or individual level services that the health unit provides, there's the immunization program, which we were speaking about briefly here. So the public health nurses go into the schools to deliver immunization clinics. They collect those student records, they assess them, and then the enforcement of the legislation um, as we are currently involved in right now. The oral health program. So every year registered, uh, registered Dental hygienists go into the schools, they do a quick visual check of children's mouths. If they identify any concerns, they'll notify the parents and they'll support them to get connected um, with the provincial subsidized programs like Healthy Smiles Ontario, if the families are eligible for that. And we also provide some preventive services at health unit clinics in Simcoe and Dunville. In each of the secondary schools has a public health nurse designated to it, and these nurses meet one-on-one -on -one with students as needed um, to support them with a variety of health topics, from quitting smoking to healthy eating, um, promoting positive mental health, and they also provide sexual health services and counseling. Um, and then they also do a lot of referring and connecting them with other supports and agencies as appropriate. Both at the elementary and secondary level, we have um, all of our staff supports our teachers and our principals, um, providing them with resources, training, consultations around curriculum and how they can implement that, and connecting them with grant opportunities around health initiatives. On a more of a population or school-wide level, we are, over the last few years, we've been taking something called a comprehensive school health approach, and that looks beyond the health curriculum and outside the classroom to the school as an entire community, as an environment, and how could we move that forward um, from a health lens. The Ministry of Education released the Foundations for a Healthy School Framework a few years back, and you'll see it contains five key components or pillars that if a school wants to move forward on a health initiative um, or see progress, they should aim to address all five of those pillars, that, hence the comprehensive. Um, and, it, and it works differently in each school. They, public health can facilitate the process, so they identify what are their priorities, their needs, their interests, and then we work with them to devise a plan and support them through the implementation. Um, and it's looking at both the physical environment and the social environment, and really involving all of the stakeholders from staff, parents, community members, students. Um, they all have an important role to play. As a quick example, going from the theoretical to how it might look in a school as a plan, so. Um, if Delhi Public, if they got, brought together some, some of their committee, their community members and identified that healthy eating is an issue they would like to move forward on, they might work with public health, come up with a plan. Over the course of a year, they could do various things such as partnering with a farmer's market or a local farmer um, to, to offer some educational opportunities for staff and students. They might look at the physical environment, what are some ways they can um, promote and support and facilitate healthy choices. So things like installing a refillable water bottle station where it would encourage water consumption rather than sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, looking, working with parent council, what are the fundraising options that they choose? Maybe moving away or looking at other choices besides the, the chocolate-covered almonds and the cookie dough and the pizza to some non-food options or, or some healthy food options. There's a great fresh, fresh from the farm um, produce fundraiser that's, that a few schools have started picking up and that's encouraging. Um, some students could get together after school, have volunteers lead a, a program. There's one called You're the Chef, where they learn basic food skills, how to prepare healthy snacks when they get home, um, rather than opening a bag of chips. And looking at the social environment, so how are good behaviors rewarded in the classroom, in the school? Are teachers doing things like uh, a bucket here that says bursting with improvement and giving out candies for, for jobs well done, or are they giving them extra gym time or giving them an opportunity to sit in the teacher's chair for a few minutes? So other non-food ways to, to encourage and support positive behaviors. And then looking at the curriculum and some of the non-traditional ways to integrate health um, across the, the subjects. So moving outside of just health and looking at things like reading recipes or nutrition labels as part of non-fiction in language or math. Um, there are lots of opportunities there. So we know that if we could get some of these things happening in schools, that would have tremendous benefits to public health. We would see health behaviors increase. But why would schools want to be a part of this? We know how taxed our schools are. They're busy. There's a lot of demands and requests placed on them. But health and education really go hand in hand. So if we see an increase in health um, behaviors in students, that has a direct impact on their behaviors and their outcomes in schools. I won't walk you through everything, but just as a quick example, if you look at student behavior, so we know that um, on, teachers spend a lot of time with on-task behavior and redirecting students, but if we can find ways to increase their physical activity before, during, and after the school day, that will help with their attention, their focus, 
Um, and there are lots of ways to integrate that through the school day and attendance. Students might not be at school for a variety of illness or injury or for mental health reasons, and we can have the best, and, and I'll say we do have the best teachers in schools, <coughs> excuse me, um, but if the students aren't there, then that's all for naught. They really can't get the education that these teachers are able to provide. So these learning traits and behaviors obviously impact the student success, and you'll notice the arrow continues back around in the cycle. So students that do well in school, that they stay in school longer, they live longer lives, they have less injury, less illness, less hospitalization, which leads to less um, burden on the healthcare system, increased productivity, et cetera. So it really is a virtuous cycle and a win-win if, if these two sectors can work hand in hand. So the bottom line to all of this is that we do serve the same child. Health and education are two large, diverse, separate sectors, monoliths, I like to call them. Um, but if we want to achieve our objectives, they really need to work together because they're symbiotic. They're mutually reinforcing. When health increases, the education outcomes increase and vice versa. So the solution to all this, what is, where, did, where do we land with all of this? Years back, public health had a tendency to kind of parachute in or work with schools here and there. We might drop in to teach a, teach a puberty class or support a health fair or, or a one-day initiative. And some of that still happens, but we want to really work on a more sustainable, comprehensive, working hand-in-hand -hand approach with the schools. And that led us to the development of the partnership protocol, which you have in your packages, and that's the reason that I'm here today. So it was developed in collaboration with both of the school boards, Brant County Health Unit and ourselves. Um, as you're probably aware, Brant, Brant County Health Unit also serves jurisdiction that is covered by the two school boards. Um, so we thought it would be prudent to work together. And it's a high level agreement. It outlines uh, a joint commitment and a recognition that health and education are really inseparable. And if we wanna reach our goals, we need to have that partnership solidified. Um, and it's, in addition to this higher level agreement, there will be subsequent um, appendices added on that address some of the operational level things. So things like the suspension process, oral health, um, the school-wide health initiatives, pandemic planning, et cetera. So those will be more of the living, breathing documents that dictate or direct the day-to-day -day work. And if they're pending endorsement by, um, by the Board of Health and all the other, other parties' um, respective boards, we are planning to have a, a signature event, um, a brief signing on May 11th at a school in Brantford um, with the directors of education for, the, for both boards and the directors of public health, and any Board of Health members are more than welcome to attend that. And how this aligns very closely with the, the revised public health standards that will be coming into effect in January, which I know the board's been introduced to. Um, so there is a new standard within the document that is specific to school health, and the overall goal of that standard is to achieve optimal health of children and youth in schools through partnership and collaboration with school boards and schools. So obviously the establishment of this agreement will, help, will go a long way to helping us deliver on that. The health unit strategic plan, um, again, a document you may be familiar with. So it identified five core values, and one of those was collaboration. So this is an opportunity to live out that value. And the, one of the priorities was the development of healthy, supportive environments. So a strategy underneath that priority was to create healthier spaces, especially for children and youth. And as we know, students spend much of their waking hours in schools, so that's a, that's a prime spot that we could be working on. There is a committee out there that's made up of the directors of education in Ontario and the MOHs in Ontario, and they also put forward a recommendation that school boards and boards of health establish and maintain such a written partnership um, to support this mutually beneficial working relationship. And in conclusion, and what we are requesting or recommending of the board is that you would support and endorse our entrance into a partnership with Grand Erie, the Brant Haldeman Norfolk Catholic District School Board and the Brant County Health Unit. Thank you, and I'll take any questions with that. Thank you very much, Mr. Daly. Well done, uh, and I do agree with you that uh, at times, teachers do uh, deal with a wide variety of uh, student behavior, no question, and uh, so this is all good for student support. Questions uh, to our presenter, uh, Mr. Wells, please. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. At the very end, you mentioned that uh, we're going to join this partnership. Is there any cost associated with this? There are no direct costs. We have, over the years, we have made some informal relationships, obviously, as we've been working with the schools. So this is just formalizing that and putting it in writing. Um, we do anticipate there would be some cost savings and efficiencies as we be brand, obviously, works under the same public health standards as we do and delivers a lot of the same programs. So we look for opportunities there for efficiencies. Further questions? Councillor Height, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to the deputation. Uh, in a recent media article, it was mentioned that uh, 150 children were not able to go back to school because they didn't have their immunization records up to date. Is that a health department thing or a Board of Education thing? It's, it's legislated through Ontario. The Board of Health is the one responsible for enforcing it. So okay. the, Board of the schools are a partner in that and that they are the ones that have to turn away the students in the morning, um, but it's not their legislation. Okay, so could you explain to us why there were so many of them? 150 seems excessive. Yep, so the cohort, and there will be a memo coming later that has an update on this, but it started out at uh, 2,325, I believe, um, students in that cohort. And then we've started, we've sent multiple notices starting in late December, um, and that number has been whittled down since. There were, I believe it was 282 students that received a suspension notice two to three weeks ago. Um, and, and then come Monday, that number was down to 136 that were actually um, actively suspended on Monday. We, the staff has continued to work with parents and they've been calling in receiving records and that number is down to 85 as of earlier this afternoon. It continues to rapidly decrease. Okay, thank you. I, I think I had number 86 show up at my door this morning and he had to take his son in to get his shots but he's not eligible to return to school until May the 2nd. What, why is the delay? Uh, I don't believe that information would be entirely correct. So if they receive their immunization and they bring and they report that to the health unit, then they get taken off the list and then they are able to return to school the next morning. But then the immunization would have to kick in effective immediately. Is that how it works? Because otherwise, if it takes a week, I could see them keeping them out. I don't know. If a student is, it gets immunized this afternoon, then they are able to get back in school tomorrow morning. Oh, that's interesting. If they, re if they report it to the health unit before the end of the yeah. business day. Yep. Okay, not what I heard this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further questions? Columbus has moved. Sonnenberg has seconded that uh, report 1706. This is the partnering together for healthy schools protocol be received as information that the Board of Health supports and endorses the Haldeman Norfolk Health Unit's entrance into healthy schools partnership agreement with the grant County Health Unit, Grand Erie District School Board, and the Brand Haldeman Norfolk Catholic District School Board and directs staff to sign the attached agreements. Any discussion? I hear none. Those in favor, please. Carried. And Josh, again, well done and thank you. Thank you. Let's go to page 18. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to hear the deputation before we hear the report. Uh, deputations are to start at roughly 3.30. We're in good shape. Uh, our first deputation this afternoon is from the Health Education Advocacy Team. It's a volunteer youth group known as HEAT. They are here to speak to us about Norfolk County smoke-free outdoor spaces bylaw. I have uh, four names here that will be here. I see three. Uh, and I think the best thing to do is to have each one of you, if you would, just give us your name and then we'll turn it over and you have 10 minutes. So rather than me try to figure out who didn't show up, uh, you can just let us know who you are, please. So uh, my name is Uzar. Uh, my name is Brendan. I'm Kristen. And uh, we're members of the Health and Education Advocacy Team, also known as HEAT. So we are a volunteer group that uh, tries to take action against the tobacco industry and we aim to expose the manipulative tactics used by the tobacco industry to sort of entice youth into using tobacco. So in the efforts of trying to prevent our fellow youth from using tobacco, uh, we sort of, we do various work including uh, hosting smoke-free events, creating a smoke-free PSA that's now playing at the Strand. Um, collecting signatures in the support of flavored tobacco ban and running events for World No Tobacco Day. So today we would like to speak to you about another issue that is very important to us, which is smoking in outdoor spaces. And we'd like to just introduce some problems that smoke -free, or, uh, smoking in outdoor spaces creates and some possible solutions that can be addressed. So we see a problem in Norfolk County. Children and youth are exposed to secondhand smoke. Being active community members, we travel across Norfolk County, whether it be going to hockey games, studying at the library, or visiting any recreational center in Norfolk County. 
The last thing you want is to walk through a cloud of smoke. Our generation is well aware of the harm that tobacco has on our health. It's a no-brainer. Secondhand smoke is very bad for you. So research has already shown that there is no safe level of secondhand smoke, not even outdoors. Um, I have asthma and I've been attack free for a while now. Um, but when I'm out with a friends or at a beach or a rec center, I shouldn't have to worry about um, like breathing in secondhand smoke and causing a potential attack. So seeing people smoking in public places normalizes tobacco use. Being a teenager, negative influences surround me from a day-to-day -day basis. The more you surround kids in negative influences, the more likely they are to copy. Banning smoking in public places will eliminate many negative influences for children and youth. Outdoor smoking also creates an unwelcoming environment for tourists, especially for people who come and use our beautiful beaches. When we go to the beach, we don't want to breathe in secondhand smoke, and we don't want to see cigarette butts buried in the sand. Cigarette butt litter is an eyesore and is not good for our environment. Cigarette butts are the most commonly littered item and are the co most common found like during beach cleanups. I'm sure you can all think of places in our community where we have seen cigarette butts littered around in public buildings or parks. Cigarette butts can take up to 10 years to decompose and they can be toxic for young children and pets. So I used to live in Lee Minkton and that's a municipality that has already uh, adapted a smoke-free bylaw. So uh, moving to Norfolk County, I actually was surprised to see people sort of smoking around the arenas and libraries and sort of thought that they were breaking the law by doing so. Uh, so just imagine the sort of impression that this leaves on families visiting from various areas in Norfolk County. So research shows that there is no safe level of secondhand smoke, not even outdoors. Norfolk County has the opportunity to protect Norfolk residents from secondhand smoke, promote a healthy environment, and help people who are trying to quit and promote positive role modeling for children and youth. The problem is not the individual. We want to create an environment that is good for everyone. Walking a dog without a leash and drinking alcohol and open burning aren't allowed in public places, so why is smoking allowed? He would like to ask that the Board of Health uh, approve a bylaw to ban smoking on municipal properties. Thank you for letting us speak to you today, and we appreciate all of your support on this issue. Thank you very much, uh, folks, for your deputation. Well done. I have Councillor uh, sorry, I have Mr. Columbus, and then Mr. Black. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Luke. <clears throat> Being that your deputation is about smoking, uh, is there any movement with respect to the legalization of marijuana? And uh, how are you handling that, that smoking as well? Are you involved with that at all, or are you just picking on the tobacco industry, which is a major economic driver so, uh, for our county? <clears throat> through the chair, uh, currently... Marijuana just uh, sorry, to just pull that microphone oh, over <laughs> so, uh, just so we can hear you. Thank sure. you. So uh, right now, uh, sort of marijuana hasn't been legalized as a recreational sort of uh, drug. So we're sort of focusing on tobacco right now because right now it's sort of we have more stats and everything to support that type of issue. So any future legislation, you could probably ask uh, one of our staff professionals, Darren, or our tobacco control officer about that for further. Uh, for the clear, for the further uh, clarification. So I take it that will be deferred to July 1st, 2018, possibly. Possible. Thank you. Mr. Black. Thank you, Chairman Luke. And uh, just the, the previous speaker was suggesting that you're picking on the tobacco industry and, and it sounds like you, you, are you picking on the tobacco industry? Are you saying that people should not smoke? Or are you just saying they shouldn't smoke in a certain area? Like, what we're saying is we're not like picking on any individual telling them like, no, you can't, like you shouldn't. It's more along the lines of informing people about the dangers of smoking and tobacco usage in, in, in outdoor spaces, for example, out in front. Like, I know that here you, I believe you can't smoke out front, but uh, parks and things like that, if someone's out there and it shows like, it makes it more uh, normalized, it's, it's more normal, like even though we do have the no smoking within, like we do have some regulations, but okay. it's... It's All right, good. Like, Thank you. I'm glad you're not picking on the industry, you three young students. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a second question and, and that is, um, I think you all know, I have an 18-year-old daughter that goes to Holy Trinity. I take her to school, I drop her off, and I go around the corner onto uh, 
Oak Street, and right there you've got two groups of students smoking, and uh, I have to roll my windows up because the smoke comes in. Um, is your group doing anything? Do you go out there and, and uh, talk to those people about smoking there and throwing all their butts on the ground? Because I, I do get the odd complaint from people across the street about the students smoking there. Um, I know they're, they're probably legally able to do it, but is there anything you as uh, their peers, because I, I believe it is also a very strong peer influence that creates uh, people smoking or drinking. So just wondered, uh, do you have some influ influential uh, genes in you to go out there and convince them not to do it? So very rarely do I ever actually go out to the smoke pit. Um, there are very, f that's what they call it. <laughs> but um, very, there are quite a few people who are, I believe, are underage who smoke. Uh, that could be because of parents. We don't know their backstories or why they, can, they started smoking. So we're not trying to, going back to your first question, we're not trying to target the industry in the first place. We're trying to minimize the potential of future smokers. So people have been influenced by parents, by movies, by people they see outdoors who they look up to. And that's what we're targeting. I don't. I have a lot of friends who do smoke. I will admit that, but I don't go out with them when they smoke. I support them, but I don't support what they do, how they're harming their bodies. Good answer. Thank you very much. Any other questions? If not, uh, board member Columbus has moved. Board member Wells has seconded that the deputation of the Heat Youth Volunteer Group be received as information. Any further discussion? If not, those in favor? That is carried, and I would like to say Brenda Cope, Yuzair Achima, and Kristen Forsyth. Did I get it right? Yeah. We want to thank you for the work you do and uh, bringing just awareness to students that, uh, you know, there are health issues with smoking. So thank you for being here today. I am now uh, on report HS 17-07, page 18 of your agenda, please. Marlene, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Darren Atroshi, who's one of our health promoters, and Amy Jones, who is one of our uh, tobacco enforcement officers, to present the report. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you very the much. Thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to provide an overview of the smoke-free outdoor spaces report. Um, so just a couple of slides. Um, so we'll get started. Do you have the clicker? Oh, thank you. So a little bit of background. Um, Haldeman Norfolk has a smoking prevalence of approximately 17.6%. Uh, that's higher than the provincial average of 16.1%. This translates into roughly uh, 17,300 individuals in the Haldeman and Norfolk areas who are classified as either daily or occasional smokers. Um, so this higher than average smoking rate may increase the risk of secondhand smoke exposure. So the World Health Organization has declared that there is no safe levels of secondhand smoke, and secondhand smoke is associated with many negative health outcomes, including uh, lung cancer, asthma, heart disease, and lower respiratory infections. So I have some data on secondhand smoke exposure rates in Ontario. This is from the Canadian Community Health Survey. Um, so individuals who responded to this either reported that they, um, ex they were exposed to secondhand smoke either on a daily or almost daily basis within the past month. So if you see the left-hand side of the graph, exposure to secondhand smoke at home and in vehicles remains relatively low. Um, and it's also further split down by age. So all adults 12 plus are in the light blue. And then our youth are isolated. So that's ages 12 to 19. Where it remains fairly high is in public places, and especially on the far right-hand side of the graph, you can see 25.4% of youth report being exposed to secondhand smoke on either a daily or almost daily basis within the past month. So secondhand smoke poses a significant risk to air quality. There was a study conducted in Toronto that looked at air quality within 9 meters of 28 different buildings. So they found that even when one to four cigarettes were lit, particulate matter, or PM, was 40% higher um, than when no cigarettes were present, which is suggestive that even a few cigarettes may pose a health to, um, sorry, a few cigarettes may pose um, a health risk. So the Smoke-Free Ontario Act ensures that a baseline protection um, from secondhand smoke in public places. However, the smoke 
Free Ontario Act overlooks uh, key municipal properties such as libraries, arenas, beaches, things of that matter. So smoke-free bylaws are a way to further protect um, citizens from secondhand smoke. And according to a scan conducted in 2017, 54 municipalities in Ontario already have smoke-free bylaws um, that protect residents above and beyond what is required in the uh, Smoke-Free Ontario Act. So there's various benefits uh, to a smoke-free bylaw. The first one being a reduction in cigarette litter. Um, so Hamilton has a smoke-free bylaw in place and they found that post-implementation of their bylaw, uh, they found a significant decrease in cigarette butts uh, in the areas that were designated as smoke-free. As well, I also have some data from Vancouver. Um, they found that post-implementation, um, their beaches saw a 58% reduction in cigarette butt litter. As well, there's also reduced risk of outdoor fires, so the less cigarette butts that are discarded improperly um, that would drive down the risk of fires. Increased protection from secondhand smoke, as well as reinforce, reinforcing positive role modeling. Our youth uh, did a really good job previously, saying the less that children and youth see individual smoking, the less that is normalized, the less likely that they are to um, take up smoking. As well as a reduction in the cleanup costs related to cigarette litter. So the less that cigarette butts are in public places, the less municipalities will have to spend in terms of cleaning up cigarette butt litter. As well as increased use of outdoor spaces that are smoke-free, uh, Woodstock has a smoke-free bylaw and they found post-implementation of that bylaw, individuals reported that they were more likely to use the outdoor spaces that were now designated as smoke-free, as well as potential positive economic impacts. I know what we've seen from the indoor smoke-free bans, that restaurant and hospitality industry either saw no impact on their sales or they had a positive impact um, post-going smoke-free. So the Haldeman Norfolk Health Unit um, will advocate for and support the development of environments that encourage and facilitate health. Uh, and this bylaw is a perfect example of creating healthier spaces, especially for our children and youth. And it's a, a great example of a development of a healthy public policy. So if I can turn your attention to Appendix B, Section 1, I'll just overview the proposed summary of the bylaw. So smoking is prohibited within nine meters of any entrance or exit of a, any municipally owned, operated, or leased building. As well, smoking is prohibited on all recreational property. Uh, and the definition of recreational property includes trails, beaches, rec centers, playgrounds, sports fields, uh, skate parks. So implementation, how does the Haldeman Norfolk Health Unit fit into this? So we can help with uh, educating and promoting the bylaw. So educating the public on what areas are affected, how it may impact them. As well, we can help in designing the signage related to the bylaw, as well as sharing experiences of other municipalities that have already implemented a smoke-free bylaw. So I did reach out to the manager of building and bylaw services in Haldeman, who already have a smoke-free bylaw in place, and he informed me that over the past few years, um, they only had a few complaints related to the bylaw, and he alluded to these bylaws being relatively self-enforcing. Uh, as well, I asked about any FTE that were um, hired in addition to uh, kind of take care of the bylaw, and he noticed that there was no additional staffing requirements, which is similar to what was found in uh, the research that conducted, um, that surveyed 36 other municipalities that's in the report. As well, we can uh, work with the bylaw department to support an enforcement strategy. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. There certainly will be some questions. Mr. Black, I may start with you. Hey, Chairman Luke, thank you very much. And through you to the deputation, I just wondered if you had any statistics on uh, what the cost uh, to Canadians is for health care and environmental uh, to address the results of smoking. Do you have though, any of those numbers, any idea what the costs are? I would imagine it would be in the billions of dollars. Yeah, I don't have those exact stats. Uh, I think Marlene might have yeah. some. Through the mayor, um, the treating uh, tobacco illnesses costs Ontario $1.6 billion in direct health care costs annually. Okay, and that's just for Ontario. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Height. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the deputation, uh, in the proposed bylaw in front of us, you have... A, it says here that the recreation area does not include any municipal golf courses. Uh, I don't think that Norfolk County owns any, but I think Tilsonburg does so. But why aren't, why are they excluded? Through the chair to councillor. Um, municipal golf courses are a private business and they're typically in what we've seen in other bylaws and other municipalities. Um, since they are relatively, um, 
my opinion on that is that they're typically uh, geared towards adults, and what we're trying to do here is protect youth and children. And that's our main focus with this bylaw, so to, to protect the youth and children, and those areas are generally used by adults. Okay, thank you. Uh, another one on, in here is you have abutting road allowances. So are you saying nine meters, your, your proposal is nine meters off of the road allowance as well? No, with the nine meters are, are off the ro road allowance, we're allowed to go up to the, to the sidewalk and then that sidewalk is no longer considered municipal property. It it's, can't be included in the bylaw. Okay, thank you. Anything further? Mr. Columbus? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, how many fines have been levied by the health unit, say, over the course of a year? Over the course of the year, there hasn't been no fine since we do have or are mandated to work off the progressive enforcement approach by the ministry. <clears throat> so our, our, our businesses and residents are minding your, your word when it comes to uh, advice, I guess. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Anything further? Mr. Brunton, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mayor Luke. Um, I find it interesting, uh, as a member of the advisory committee, that we spend almost $400,000 on the smoking programs, I believe, in the health department. That's in the budget. I wonder, and somebody mentioned it, when we get into uh, legalized marijuana, where that's going to lead us. Uh, one level of government wants to stamp it out. The other level of government wants to promote it. And I really wonder which way we are going. If uh, recently with the e-cigarettes, um, will they be able to smoke uh, those things continually after? Uh, if, if the government's, like it's supposed to be non-hazardous, but they want to stamp it out, Do, am I correct on that? Through the chair to Councillor Brunton. Um, E-cigarettes, the, there is some data on e-cigarettes. Um, in the recent article that came across my inbox, um, the implications of smoking e-cigarettes are roughly the same as having diabetes in terms of the risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, in terms of marijuana and e-cigarette legislation, that's still through at the federal level. So if you would like a, another report on marijuana, that I would be happy to provide that. But in terms of this report, we're specifically looking at tobacco and cigarettes. Yeah, I realize that, but if you, from our standpoint, it's got to be frustrating when we sit down and try to look at a budget for our smoking program, and yet the other level of government's going to come out and promote legalized marijuana. And I, of course, I guess they can make all kinds of things other than cigarettes out of it. Eh? Um, brownies, I've heard they make brownies and all these things with marijuana. So maybe, uh, maybe it is all health related. Thank you. Yeah, a question or two I have, uh, Darren, if I can, to you, and, I, and again, I'm not trying to corner you on anything, but as someone brought up here, we do not have a municipal golf course in Haldeman or Norfolk that I'm aware of, so I really don't know why that would even be in our bylaw, uh, prohibiting it on something we don't have, because there are many things we don't have in this municipality, and they are not included in here. Uh, and... Even if we had a municipal golf course, I would really like to know the rationale why, as per Section A, I could sit in a public park and I'm not allowed to have a cigarette with anybody else in the park but me, as in Section A, and yet we're doing preference by saying, yeah, but if you're a golfer in a municipal park, i.e. golf course, you can stand on the first tee block with three other people or anybody and have a cigarette. I, I find that very... I just don't find that right. Do you wish to comment or tell me, tell me if, I, if I'm crazy? I don't mind, but I just feel that Section C shouldn't even be in there. And if you feel that way, we can certainly take it out. I believe it's in there because it is in the Smoke Free Ontario Act. Uh, it is an exemption throughout their parks and playgrounds. But we can certainly take that out and include golf courses. And also, if I may, and again, that'll be up to Council. Uh, Lake Erie, 20 meters, what are we talking here? 70, 75 feet from the shore. Someone pulls up in a boat to fish, and usually Lake Erie you're not, you're further out, but we, we have jurisdiction to, to patrol a person 
I shouldn't say patrol to enforce a person in a boat sitting in a uh, federal jurisdiction. We have that uh, the right to do that. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm just asking for clarification. I think that would be a tough one. I believe we have the right. Most of the, the evidence with the bylaws is that they're self-enforcing. That once we put up the, the signs and and educate the the general public, they are self-enforcing as and they they don't do it normally and. Uh, they correct the, the issue on, on themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Columbus. Mr. Chairman, it's kind of ironic that I think we're the only county that has a golf course owned by the province of Ontario. They would be exempt under this bylaw, right? And it's uh, the Turkey Point Golf Course is owned by the province. So that, you, in other words, you could smoke on the Turkey Point Golf Course, which is owned by the province, but you can't kind of ironic that it's happening that way. So the recreational property is only municipally owned, I believe. Um, and so uh, the, the Turkey Point golf course wouldn't be included. But again, we can, we can take out the golf course section or add in more sections. This is just the, the idea that, that we support. Thank you. So for clarification, if this bylaw as it's printed is passed, would we be able to smoke at Turkey Point golf course or not? At the present time, you would be able to. Even with this bylaw enforced, because it's, it's provincially owned, not municipal. That's correct. I know in Hamilton, the Shadow courses are municipally owned, and, and many uh, municipalities do have them. Thank you very much. Anything else? <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. You can have a seat. Thank you for presenting that report to us. Been moved by a member Sonnenberg, seconded by member Black, that this report 17-07 Norfolk County Smoke-Free Outdoor Spaces bylaw be received as information and that the Board of Health approves the draft bylaw presented and forwards to Norfolk Council for approval. Discussion on this motion. Okay, Councillor, uh, sorry, Mr. Height, and then Mr. Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure that I'm ready to move this forward right at this time because yeah, we've heard from some students, we've heard from our staff, but we haven't heard from the public. That public is 16,000 people strong right now. That's almost as many that voted in the last election. I, I, I'm not that comfortable moving this ahead on their behalf without hearing from them. And hearing from them, we shall. Probably the day after tomorrow, after this hits the press, and then we'll get all kinds of phone calls and stuff. And I'd like to get some farm work done later this week, Mr. Mayor. So. I'd prefer that it just got to the public and we could receive comments on it from them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Black? <coughs> well, me. I've received comments from the rest of the people that don't smoke. And, uh, of course, uh, this is all about, as we heard from the deputation, it is about our youth. And what we're trying to do is stop them from smoking in the beginning. It's not about uh, telling people that you cannot smoke yourself uh, in, in other areas, but only in areas that are affecting the health of other people. And um, the other percentage is, what is it, 80% or something like that, that are being affected by this. Um, yes, we are the smoking capital, tobacco capital of Ontario or Canada, and uh, uh, our industry is still thriving. It's still producing some 50 million pounds of tobacco every year. Um, it's still a viable industry. So we're not attacking the industry on this. Um, we are looking at the health of our community. And I asked the question, what, what are the costs? There are revenues, there are taxes that uh, are gained, and there's an economic benefit to at least this area. What, what are the, the actual costs as a result of smoking, we've, we've just heard. It's in the billions, just in Ontario. What about all of Canada? What about all of North America? So the costs are horrendous and certainly do not justify uh, allowing smoking uh, in public places. So I will support this, and I hope my fellow colleagues do as well for our children. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? One, two, three, four, five. Those, those opposed? 
That is carried. Thank you. Yes, sir. This will go to uh, council for, uh, or, is, or have we just done that with the, uh, the bylaw? Well, this is a draft bylaw, and it is approved here at the Board of Health. It'll now go to Norfolk County Council for a bylaw uh, uh, to be finalized. Thank you. Either approved or not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our final deputation for the Board of Health is Marilyn Ann Q, and she is here with the Tamarack Communities membership. Marilyn, if you come forward, please, and uh, welcome to the council chambers. Um, we'll give you. Thanks, Andy. Mr. Beard's going to fix it all up. I just want to thank you for your effort. Yeah, cool. Nice to see. Somebody's going to lean on this and fall over. Health department, take note. Workplace has. Exactly. I know, they're going to fall my way, Carol, not your way. I'm a slow learner. I refuse to go to Fort Bowman. The wires. No, not going for the phone. I'm not going to go to the phone. I can't school. No more beach. Again, welcome, Marilyn, and uh, we have 10 minutes, and uh, you get up over 9, I'll just sort of give you a warning. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. Okay, just, just to wrap it up, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and council members of the Board of Health. Um, okay, I better. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Poverty Action Partnership of Haldeman and Norfolk. And um, we presented a deputation a while back, and I thought maybe um, I brought a few slides from that uh, just to remind you that the Poverty Action Partnership of Haldeman and Norfolk will be broadly representative of the communities of Haldeman and Norfolk, including people with lived experience. And our membership is outlined there. There's an, we have a number of groups, but what we seem to need more of now is more Haldeman representation. Um, and um, in Norfolk, we're slowly building um, uh, kind of an advisory group of people with lived experience, or as some refer to as consumers. Um, I'm going to start here. Uh, we presented a, this de a deputation and uh, asked Haldeman Council and Norfolk Council for support of our mission. Poverty Action Partnership of Haldeman Norfolk exists to find solutions to poverty by raising awareness, reducing stigma, mobilizing and strengthening our community to take action. This creates our vision. Whoops. This creates our vision. A